Welcome to the 46th Mill Valley Film Festival. It's so wonderful to see you all here. My name is Celeste Wong. I'm the U.S. Indies Programmer with the Mill Valley Film Festival with the absolute honor and privilege to welcome you all to our very special director's night screening of Fancy Dance. Welcome. I want to start off by giving a very, very big thank you to the sponsor for tonight, which is RBC Wealth Management. Thank you so much. Um, a few notes up top, and perhaps you've heard me or my colleagues um, mention this before. I want to mention our resiliency fund that we've kicked off. It's a fundraising campaign for the California Film Institute, which, as you may know, puts on the Mill Valley Film Festival. We also put on the documentary film festival, Docklands, in the spring. And of course, we have our year-round events at the Smith Rafael Film Center through the California Film Institute. As you probably know, arts nonprofits have been hit quite hard the last few years. We are really, really excited because we've seen quite a growth in the last year, actually about 30% more ticket sales just over the last year. So that's very exciting and that's really thanks to you all for, for coming out to the movies and supporting us. But we're not quite at the levels that we were pre-COVID. So we've kicked off to this resiliency fundraiser hoping to raise more funds to keep the same level of incredible programming and to not have to make any cuts. So we're very excited. We have a very generous donor who has offered to match donations up to $100,000. So we really, really hope we can get there. We need your help. Um, if you can, if you have some extra to give, please consider. Um, there's a QR code behind me. You can point your phone camera at that. It'll direct you to a donation page. Um, we really appreciate any amount you can give because of that matching donation. Of course, your donation will be doubled. Um, but you're already here. You got a ticket. You're sitting in our seats. You're supporting the film festival and supporting independent filmmakers. So you're already doing so much. And I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, really. So, on to our feature presentation. Um, it's very, very exciting that we are uh, having director's night with Fancy Dance. You know, I work mostly with independent films and independent filmmakers, and we don't always get to do a big night celebration with them. So, this is really incredible. I think Erica Tremblay is a perfect, perfect um, recipient for this honor because she represents so much of what gives me so much hope for the future of the film industry and independent filmmaking in general. Um, please stick around, there will be a Q&A after the screening, but for now to introduce the film, I'm very honored to welcome Erica Tremblay. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Celeste. And skeno swagwego on the way esta nigiaso akasenoni nancho ikes. I'm just so thrilled and happy to be here tonight. Um, it's you feel like you're working in a vacuum when you're writing and when you're directing and when you're making a film. And so the fact to see you all here, there are many things you could be doing tonight on this Friday the 13th, but you chose to be here um, to see this film and, and, and share in, in, in the um, relationship of making it and watching it. And independent film is in a really weird place right now. Our industry is in a real weird place. Um, I know Lily Gladstone um, really, yes? Um, I saw some t-shirts here with her name on it and I already sent her the photo so she she's here in spirit she really wanted to be here but I think it's important to take a moment to support the Screen Actors Guild I'm in the WGA I'm in the DGA and um, you know we don't get to do what we do without the amazing actors um, so I'm in full support of, of, of our actors not being here tonight and the reasons why they're not here tonight. Um, so it's important to say that. Um, I'm from the Seneca Cuga Nation. I grew up in Oklahoma and Missouri. Um, yeah, Seneca Cuga Nation. They love that. Um, you know, I've always wanted to make films about my community. I've always wanted to make films in my community and tell these stories. And it's taken a long time to find partners who are brave enough to put the money up, um, who are, are willing to take this journey. So it's exciting that this is my first feature film. I'm also a writer and director on Res Dogs and I think we're at this, we're at this zeitgeisty moment where we're finally in control of our own narrative 
And I'm very, very excited to share this story with you of an aunt and a niece um, grounded in their joy and love for each other and their community. And um, what an honor to be chosen to be here for Director's Night. Um, and I hope that you enjoy it. And I'm excited to talk to you after. Nyawa. Please give a warm welcome back to Erica Tremblay. <laughs> Erica, congratulations on the film and thank you so much for sharing it with the Mill Valley Film Festival. We're so honored to have you here. Um, since this is director's night, uh, I want to kind of start at the beginning and ask you what inspired you to become a director? Um, I think I always wanted to be a director, but like didn't recognize or understand that it was like even like a thing. Like when I was a kid, I used to be like that bossy girl in the neighborhood that would like force my neighbor friends to like do trampoline routines and like plays. And in junior high, I remember making my mom buy me a VHS recorder at Goodwill. And I used to like record those really terrible <laughs> plays and trampoline routines and like edit between the VCR and the, the camcorder. Um, but I, I grew up in the 90s and that was like Quentin Tarantino and Kevin Smith. And like that was like the era of that independent cinema. And it wasn't until I was in my early 20s, I think 21, when I saw a film called High Art, which was this like queer film, and I was coming into my own queerness at that time as well. And at the end, I was watching it, and I was like, what is this? Like, I have never seen anything like this. And at the end, it said, directed by Lisa Cholodenko. And I was like, oh shit, like a woman can direct a film. And I didn't even know that that was a possibility until I was like a fully grown adult as much as you can be at the age of 21, but that's when my eyes were kind of open to the possibility. I'd already like gone to school, I'd studied media studies, but then I started just making like really small little things like with friends. And I was like, oh, I can maybe be a director, so. <laughs> I love that because, you know, I, I hope that soon we're past the stage of all these firsts, you know. Um, we're not quite there yet, but I can imagine a lot of young folks watching this film and seeing themselves represented in that role perhaps for the first time and knowing that's, that that's a possibility. So um, what has the reception been like for this film? Uh, not for young audiences, but everyone. Um. I mean, so far it's just been so rewarding. You make something and you, you're you terrified to like share it, but at the same time, it's like why you made it. It's like this very weird relationship, but um, you know, we got to film this in Oklahoma where I grew up and we got to make it mostly on Cherokee Nation land. So we were shooting on reservation land and we had so many indigenous crew and cast and, I think it was just great to get to make it. And then we've been, you know, we premiered at Sundance and then we've had other screenings. But I think for me, I screened the film on our ancestral lands in upstate New York, where, where, I, where I live now on, on Cayuga lands. And um, we had like elders there and we had like people from the community watching it. It was the first time that I'd actually gotten to share it with the people that I made it for. And that was an extremely rewarding experience because we had a couple of elder speakers. Um, and the language is considered extinct. There are less than 20 speakers of the language left. And um, you know they're in their 80s and 90s and they were watching for the first time in their life, they were watching the language in a film. It's the first, and so that's when you're like, okay, like regardless of how well it does or like what it does for your career, or like all of those things like are important and are things you think about, but like that moment is why I made the film and they got to like see that and like they were like really emotional about it and then they're like, you got the glottal stops, you did good. Like they were really impressed with um, Lily and Isabel's like way they spoke. We took it very seriously and 
So I think that reception is like the warmest. And then, I mean, I also hope that everyone else likes it too. <laughs> I wanted to actually ask you about the language and your use of language. Um, just from, from the writing process, um, how did you approach weaving that into the script and the different moments where the language is just so, so um, central to the story and the characters? Yeah, so I had made a film, a short film that actually screened here in Mill Valley um, in 2020 called Little Chief. And Lily Gladstone was also in that short film. And the response to the character and the world was, was really good. And so I was like, hey, would you do something larger? So we set out to write the script and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted it to be in the kind of the same world of the short film with a similar character, but not like extend that out. And I had taken off, um, I was kind of going through like a crisis of faith in my whole life and I'd quit my job in advertising and publishing and I had moved to a small reservation in Canada where I was doing a full-time language immersion program. So for eight hours a day, I was learning Cayuga with seven other people in my cohort. And then at night I was writing. And when we learned the familial words, we were doing like, you know, mother, all those things. I learned that the word for mother was knoha and that the word for aunt was knoha ah, which means like small mother. And it was this, you know, I've always grew up in my community. I've gone to ceremony, I've been, the, but there was something so amazing about having a new connection to my culture through a language that had been stunted and was kind of preserved from colonialism and the patriarchy. And you could see the matrilineal kinship and how important that was. You could feel the matriarchy in the use of pronouns. It's like the opposite of English. It's like, instead of you man, it's like you woman, right? Like, it, it, and I wanted to imagine what a modern day story would look like where young people spoke the language fluently, which is not the case. And what we're trying so hard to revitalize was the language that has been stolen from us. Um, but while, we were, while I was writing, while myself and my co-writer Michiana were writing, I was in this immersion program and so we would go to you know, Tim Hortons or whatever and we would be speaking in the language and then when we would pop in and out, you know, what, trying to understand when we were switching back and forth. And so I really wanted to have the moments where they were saying really meaningful things to be in the language. And then also I loved the device of them using it as a tool to navigate non-native spaces. Um, and so we made those decisions that way. And then sometimes we just said it in English because the Cayuga words were really hard. But we were able to like morph and grow. And I think another thing, we the, the language doesn't have words for a lot of modern things, like computer. I mean, slowly those words are being created because it hasn't been used widely for many years. Um, but we worked with elders, myself and Kisa Parker, who was our language consultant, who I went to immersion with. Um, we, we came up with words for the set calls. So like action, sound speeds, cut, all those things. And we made lanyards and handed them out um, on the first day. And by the third day, everyone was just calling all the calls in Cayuga. So it wasn't just that we wanted the language to be like a prop or to be, a, a, you know, a, a fancy or whatever it was the cornerstone of how we were coming together as a crew and, and communicating. And then people were getting jealous because they didn't have a Cuga word for their call, so we were like adding more as we went. And my favorite anecdote around that is my, our AD messaged me several months after the film and she had been working on a soundstage overnight. She's like, I just yelled Satrice because I'm so tired. And I was like, keep using it. Like, just tell them what it means. And so um, the language was extremely important part of the whole process. Thank you for sharing that. I think that intentionality really comes through and is just so beautifully done. Um, you mentioned that Lily Gladstone was in your short film, Little Chief, which we loved here. Um, can you speak to uh, what it was like working with her, but also Isabel and what that casting process was like for her. They, they did such a fabulous job and built such a lived-in relationship. Um, how was it working with them and creating that? I mean, Lily, 
is going to be nominated and probably win an Oscar this year because she's so, so amazing and she deserves every bit of the amazing attention that's coming her way. Um, and I had worked with her, you know, on my short film and I remember seeing her for the first time, like many of us, in uh, Certain Women, Kelly Reichardt's film. And I remember just seeing that face. And when I had the opportunity through Sundance to make a short film, my uh, mentor was Sterling Harjo. And I said, do you know this Lily Gladstone? Like, I would, like, do you think she would do this? <laughs> and so he's like, ah, here's her email, email her. And so I emailed her and she was so gracious enough to come to Oklahoma and shoot that short film. And we just became very good friends and um, collaborators. And so she was a part of the process for Fancy Dance from the beginning. We would send her pages, she would um, give feedback, we would talk a lot about the character. Um, but like Lily, they're just so like amazing. And, and because I knew what her face does on the screen, before we even had a financier, before we even had really a draft that was like ready to shoot, we had gotten some grant money and my producer Deidre Bax and I knew that we needed to take that money and immediately hire a, ca hire a casting director. Be because we knew that if the money ever did come for the film, it was gonna take a very long time to find Roki. And it did, we, we, um, I worked with Angelique Midthunder who also works on Reservation Dogs and um, we did a North American wide casting call and I saw dozens and dozens of tapes of really, really talented young indigenous, you know, girls for this role. But I needed like someone who wouldn't like, like, hot, like kind of shrink down with Lily's like star power. And I was working on an AMC series called Dark Winds and we were looking for like a 17 year old pregnant teen and Isabel's like, face comes on and I was like, there's no way, like she looks 12, like she can't be our 17 year old that's pregnant. But I immediately messaged the casting director and I said, contact this person immediately, I found our Roki. And she read and it was like, it, I knew that that was, like as soon as I saw her, I knew that, that it was her. And um, on the first day when those two met, it was like, like the chemistry just existed in real life. And for two weeks they did language immersion uh, for like five hours and then did like dance for a, for a few hours. And they were like pranking each other, pranking me, pranking like, they just, they just, and like there's very, like Isabel plays like Young Lily in a TV show that's coming out soon. And like they lit like been in Vancouver together. I mean, they're just, they're, they're together now forever. And, um, it's great to see that sort of like family come out of something like you're just going to do your job to make a movie. Lovely, thank you. Um, I wanna ask you a little bit, I'm, I'm really moved by filmmakers who are able to create this really, what I imagine to be a very difficult balance um, in terms of creating films about social issues, about things that are challenging or perhaps you know heavier, dark, um, but exploring them in a way that doesn't feel exploitative or, um, you know, yeah, mining that trauma in a way that feels, you know, exploitative or extractive. Um, how, do you, how do you create that balance in, in your writing and in your directing um, to not, you know, sugarcoat anything or, or shy away from anything, but create that balance? It's hard. It's really, really hard. Um, you... I was just constantly in conversation with my faith keepers and my longhouse about like what to show in terms of ceremony. There are two ceremony scenes in the film. There was a third that I'd wanted to include and they were like, no way. Um, and I listened to them and I respected that they are the ones that, that, that not seek permission, but I respect them so much that I wanted it to, so there's like just a respect on that cultural level. Um, but then I think as a native person who is effect, affected by the topics that are in the film, you know, we knew from the get-go that this had thriller elements, but it wasn't gonna be a film where you like saw another dead native woman because we never need to see that on screen again ever. Um, and we, we wanted, we, 
and we've been criticized for that, and that's fine because everyone can have their own opinions, but we weren't going to see Towie's body, we weren't going to say how she died because that's not what the film was about. The film was always about the love between Jax and Roki, but it's hard, you know, like in all the shows that I work on and Res Dogs, all of this stuff, we're constantly having this conversation, constantly. Like, how do we talk about the things that are actively happening to us or have happened to our family and our ancestors without re-traumatizing ourselves, without re-traumatizing the Native people who watch it, and without extracting, right, and using, using that trauma as a commodity and which, which non-native directors and writers have been doing forever. They use our pain as a commodity. And so it's easy to fall into that, that trope or fall into those ways. I think we just always tried to ground it in what, what we've really experienced and f trying to find like the truth um, beneath all of the kind of oppressive layers that are over the top but at the end it's just like they're still I hope you guys laughed at least a couple of times like they're still like laughing with each other and making jokes because that's how it feels on a reservation like I always like laugh when people think about trailer parks or they say stuff about trailer parks and I'm just like you eat food in there for dinner and you watch TV and you get in fights with your mom and you have sex with your girlfriend. You know, like the same life is happening inside a trailer park on Pine Ridge as it is anywhere. It's just different. And I think it's like, how do you shine a light on the humanity that exists in these spaces versus how do you try and extract the pain and make it as dramatic as possible? Because I think humanity outwins drama every time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I think we have just a few minutes for some audience questions, and we do have limited time, so please ask your question briefly. There we go. <laughs> Hi, uh, lovely film. Thanks very much. Tell us a little bit about the symbolism of the cow chain. Yeah. Um, so yeah. The question, just to repeat the question for those who didn't hear, was about the symbolism of the, the pouch and the context. Yeah, it's a, it's a tobacco offering. Um, she's kind of coming to the, the truth that her sister will not return. And that was another one of those scenes where it was like, let's just show what it is versus trying to like explain what it is. Because I think when you watch it, you understand that she's going through something. She's like mourning Towie. Um, and just worked really closely with my faith keep keepers on like what to what I could show and like what you could hear during that scene. But yeah, she's, she's kind of offering a blessing for her sister to like go safely on her way. Any other questions? We might have time for just one more. Yeah, over there. Were there any scenes that didn't make the final cut but that you wish you could put back in there? Oh, yeah. Um, I learned very early on in this business that you kind of have to be ferocious in the editing process. And I think that comes from like working in television. Um, we had a scene where they went and like got a lunch at Costco where they ate the free samples. Um, there were like some of the like more fun scenes like that, but it was slowing down the momentum. Um, but most of the stuff, I mean, yeah, I mean, I was pretty, my editor actually was like, slow down. I was like, get rid of it. Because we also, we, 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 our last day of shooting was September 25th. And we found out like six weeks, five weeks later that we got into Sundance. So we had to like edit this film in literally like, like nine weeks. So I had no time to like be precious about anything. So maybe we'll get the director's cut at some point. <laughs> All right, I think we have time for one more question. Anyone out there? Yes? So the question was about the score and the use of music and sound. Um, so Samantha Crane um, did the score for the film. She's an indigenous, um, musician 
super talented. You should look up her like indie folk music is really awesome, but she's also like composes music as well. She works on Reservation Dogs. And um, I knew I didn't want like a ton of music just because I felt like for my first time out, I knew I would probably use it as a crutch or I don't know, I was scared of the music, I think. But um, I worked with Samantha, I sent her some seed songs. Um, and in our culture, like women are the horticulturists, the scientists, they're the ones that grow all of the food and grow all of our like big orchards and our um, fields of corn. Um, and part of their job as, as like the, who like, bringing the corn to life is they give offerings and they sing seed songs. And so these seed songs, um, unfortunately, aren't largely used anymore because when our land was taken from us, that mat matrilineal matriarchal role was also stolen from us. Um, but those seed songs still exist in some forms. And so I thought this journey of growth, uh, Roki's coming of age, um, their relationship growing together, their, um, love growing, that the seed song would be a good foundation. So she did a lot of um, vocal, percussive, using her voice as the percussion, um, and just using kind of our traditional uh, songs as inspiration uh, for the score. And um, I was really, really happy with the process of working with Samantha. And again, just finding intention in the choices that we made. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. but. I really enjoy the score. And then the last song that you hear when the credits roll is just a young woman who made a YouTube video of a song. And we found her and reached out to her and were able to use it. And like people were like, oh, do you want to like have a different recording? Or do and I'm like, no, I love that you can hear her daughter laughing in the background, like running by with toys. And it's a, it feels real and raw. Um, and so, so yeah. and. Um, that, that's what we did, and I, again, I know that was our last question, so I'll just say, like, um, yeah, went like so much for being here tonight, and so many of you stayed for the Q and A, which is, was just, is overwhelming, but also heartwarming, um, and you know, hopefully, just keep supporting independent film, and hopefully, we'll keep making it. Um, and I just appreciate Mill Valley so much for having us here, and um, appreciate you all for for participating. Thank you so much. Erica Tremblay, everyone. Thank you all for being here.